Good evening. We are now in our sixth session of the White House uh, Communications course. One of the new things that we have added is that um, you, if you're watching it uh, on video stream live, if you want to, um, to ask a question, this is the way that you can do it. You can email your question to uh, Mike Corsi, who is in the classroom at Towson. And the email address is TU for Towson University, 475, which is the number of the course, at Towson, T O W S O N dot E D U. That's T U 475 at Towson dot E D U. And this evening, it's a pleasure to have with us Elizabeth Bumiller, who is a, a correspondent uh, at the White House for the New York Times. Elizabeth has worked uh, for the Times and, and also for the Washington Post, and she brings to her beat a, um, a broad uh, experience covering uh, not just other uh, institutions in Washington, but also throughout the world, because she has spent time as a correspondent in Tokyo and also in New Delhi. And she has written about uh, women in, uh, in families in, in, uh, in both countries. So she brings a lot more than, um, than just a uh, political uh, understanding of the, uh, the White House as an, as an institution. And I think, um, Elizabeth, uh, is a, a place to, uh, to start. Um, uh, Helen uh, Thomas, when she was here, was talking about how important the press is as a surrogate for the public. Um, what is your view? Of, um, of where the press uh, comes in in a representative system? Uh, well, not surprisingly, I think the press is really important. Um, I think that, um, I mean, we can talk about what the White House thinks of the press, but from what I think is that we, are, we play a really important role in trying to ferret out what's, um, what's really going on in the government. And, and uh, you know, the, every day the White House puts out announcements and, and uh, the President makes speeches, but that's only um, w one part of the story. And my role is to dig underneath the official pronouncements and speeches and press conferences and try and tell Americans, or at least at my readers, you know, um, a million readers during the week and two million on Sunday. Um, uh, what is the motivation? What the what is the White House really doing? What is, um, what are our elected leaders really doing b behind uh, the the public facade? It's a hard job. It's hard to f actually find out in this White House. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the ways in, in which um, they're uncooperative in providing the kind of information <laughs> that, that you would like? Um, and I would say almost in all ways. Uh, there, this is a tough White House. I'm sure you've heard this if you've heard from other reporters who cover this White House. Um, uh, it's, it's one of the, I, you know, I've been in and out of Washington over the last 20 years. I was, I worked for the Washington Post during the first term of Reagan. And, and so you can't just say that Republicans are like this, that Republic, you know, Republicans aren't real friendly with the press. This White House is extraordinary. Um, they, um, everything, there's, everything is controlled. They're very disciplined. I mean, they like to get, they get together in the morning and they have sort of a message meeting and that's going to be their message of the day. So at least publicly, no matter what question you ask of any member of the administration, you're going to get the same response down to the same phrasing. I mean, Scott McClellan did it today at the White House, at the early White House briefing. We were all asking Scott, um, did the administration or did the White House view the uh, the vote in Spain, which, you know, as you all know, that the uh, people of Spain elected a socialist government and, and threw out the uh, the government of the uh, that was friendly to the Bush administration after the bombings. And so we all asked Scott, you know, f five different ways. Did he think this was a problem for the White House? And did he think that um, the voters were trying to send um, a message? And, and, and um, Scott never answered the question. He just reverted every time to his talking points and his pr planned statement, which was that terrorism is a terrible thing and you can do any kind of political analysis you want, but terrorism is terrible and, and we will not let it defeat us. And so um, it's very frustrating. Yeah. 
Um, do you think, to, uh, to some extent, if you look back, Republican administrations mm -hmm. have that um, uh, they have that uh, that type of pattern that um, uh, when you look at their operations, they're organized for communications. They're organized towards persuasion rather than for providing information. So that often the press secretary is responsible to the communications director, and um, uh, that. They're focusing on their plan, uh, like they plan, say, three to four months out, and they want to talk about what they want to talk about. But, um, but, but that's it. I mean, that was true with uh, Nixon planned out. The uh, Reagan people um, also planned, and they put people in the in the press uh, position, in the press secretary's position, whose job it was basically to say what they that that message that they had developed. Right, but the Reagan, that's absolutely true, and I think that's true of Republican administrations, but the Reagan administration, they were fabulous leakers. I mean, uh -huh. yeah, the, the Larry Speaks, who was press secretary for the first term, for mo most of the first term when I was in town. Should I look at you, or who do I look at? I'm confused now. What's the best uh, uh, look at the TV screen, or I look at... Oh, we, we, we can uh, talk, okay. and then when, the, when we get um, the questions... Look up there. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So I look up there. Yeah. <coughs> um, they, um, you know, Larry Speaks, the press secretary, would go out with the line of the day. But the, the great thing about the Reagan administration was that um, they, uh, they all leaked wildly and madly, you know, during the day. I mean, if from Jim Baker to David Gergen to the, you know, from the White House chief of staff to, to the deputy chief of staff to all sorts of other people at the White House. They would talk to us about what was really going on, um, and mm -hmm. and that doesn't happen here. Uh, the president has has uh, is uh, has hired an enor an extraordinary group of people who are intensely loyal and intensely disciplined, and there's just very little that comes out of this White House that isn't uh, that they don't want out. Um, so it's hard as a reporter. Uh huh. And, and I guess Baker thought that it was important for reporters to have an understanding of policy. And right. so he did a lot of background briefing uh, because of that. Right. And there's very little uh, explanation. Two things. There's very little explanation of policy in this White House. I mean, if you read some of the books that have come out, the, the very beginning of these sort of tell-all books by former members of the administration, uh, they, you know, um, they say that there's like no policy going on. It's all the political shop and the communication shop that are that are running things. And there's a, a, an appalling uh, shallowness about policy. That's at least what you know, um, uh, former Treasury Secretary O'Neill said, Paul O'Neill. Um, and uh, the other thing, so I mean, you could argue the other way. I mean, because I think there are a few members of the White House who you can talk policy with, but it's it's hard to do it. I mean, they have to get permission. The other thing is that um, I think there's a real aversion in this White House to talking about anything human about President Bush. The president doesn't like it. And I struggle with this all the time because the stuff I write is, is, some t is often more, you know, personal and more connected to Bush the man. And they just hate that stuff because the president hates it for whatever reason, even if it's, you know, positive. So I think, but as a result of their communications policy, they don't, you don't get any, the public, and I don't get a sense, or I get not enough sense that I want, and the public doesn't get a sense of how Bush acts as president. You know, he's a much more engaged, active president than, the pub, than a lot of the people, a lot of the public thinks. And, but there's so little of that that comes out because it's, it's, it's such a rigid, you know, message every day. That's mm -hmm. I think it hurts them in that way. They wouldn't agree with that, but that's what I think. Uh huh. And also, perhaps it it, um, it hurts them um, uh, that at the margins because uh, uh, reporters don't trust uh, don't trust them for the information that they get uh, from them uh, because they give so little of it. So if a White House wants to say, you know, trust us, we're going to give you things, they don't have a history. Like say with the National Guard. Um, you know, the president had said in, uh, in his Russert interview that he would give information about his National Guard days, and it took until Friday to get that information. Wow. And in between, um, Scott McClellan got uh, beaten up in the uh, gag on the briefing well, every day. Well, that was a mess. Um, I would say, I'm, well, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that my issue, I don't, I don't know of any instant when I've been outright 
lied to. I mean, I don't. That, that that's not my issue. My issue is mostly that the the uh, that you you can never get them off the uh, the talking points. I mean, they just you can't you can't engage them intellectually in a way that <laughs> is helpful to my stories, you know, or to helpful to the readers, and that's really frustrating. I think on the National Guard, that was a whole other mess. Uh, the president sort of just said in this interview, okay, I, I want everything out. They, I mean, I think I would give them the benefit on the doubt of, uh, I would give them that, that they didn't know what was out there, and then they t spent a whole week uh, just getting all that stuff out of, it all uh -huh. came out of Colorado. Um, Scott said at one point in the briefing, you heard him, we're not, we're only going to give out stuff related to his record, you know, to, you know, Scott pulled back for a couple days and then they came out again and it was kind of, uh, it, they were in a mess on that, but I think it was because Scott made some little missteps maybe and also, um, they didn't, uh, I, I give I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. They didn't know what they had coming out of Colorado, and then what came out really didn't help very much. Do you think that a uh, that a communications operation that's that's geared towards developing a plan and developing a message that um, one of the inherent problems it has is stopping stopping and listening, that it's hard to listen, that um, that sometimes you can miss things that are coming up because everybody has a job and their job is to carry that message forward. And that sometimes uh, that it's hard. Yeah, I think that's what's happening now with the Kerry campaign a little bit. Um, the White House is sometimes it's I sometimes feel like the New York Times is like this too. It's this big battleship and it's very hard to turn around on a dime. Yeah. And the Kerry campaign right now is me lean and mean, and they've got really good people for the sort of the best of the Democratic Party working working now for that campaign. And they're you know they're they're young and they're. They're they're um, they're just completely focused and energized, and they're just slamming this stuff this stuff out about Bush, you know, six times a day, and the White House is a little slow because I mean they're getting I, I think they're getting better. They, it's only been a couple of weeks now, but uh -huh. the last they really um, yeah they they develop their plan early in the morning, but then it changes all day long, and they're real slow to come back. I mean they really got they really <laughs> got undercut last week when. When uh, the president was, this has been written about, but it was, I mean, I'm, the president was all set to announce his new job czar, you know, this new guy who was going to, you know, create jobs in America. He announced in, on Labor Day that, um, okay, we're going to have a job czar. And then he had a big plan to, to announce this guy on Thursday. And this guy was actually in town on Wednesday night, ready for mm -hmm. his press conference on Thursday. Well, the Kerry campaign got wind of this and completely undercut the president and just announced that this guy was going to be announced and said, and guess what? You know, he's an outsourcer. He's opened up, he's laid off American workers and he's opened up a factory in China. And by, you know, 24 hours later, this guy had, you know, no job in Washington. Yeah. I mean, they really, <laughs> that was pretty good guerrilla warfare, I would say. But they would have been just um, a little bit more clever if they hadn't said anything until he was formally announced, because he never was formally announced. And they could have, you know, maybe Oh, the Kerry campaign, right, you mean? Yeah, yeah. If they just had held back until the name actually came out, the White House sent it up to the Hill. And but then this way they didn't, but this way they, but this was more effective, I think, because it, they didn't get, the guy didn't get named, and now there's no job yeah. czar. Yeah. You know what I mean? So now there's the the position is still empty, and it just showed that they could they could back the White House into a corner if they had. I mean, I guess you're right. You could go either way. Yeah. But if they'd waited, and then they, they would have just said, "Oh well." I mean, I was amazed the White House caved on that. But it, they also said it was because it was because this guy who's from Nebraska is um, that Hagel, that Senator Chuck Hagel had problems with him. So I don't know. Uh huh. It was a pretty good mess, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a difficult to get uh, to switch from uh, a governing mode to right. getting into a campaign because the the cycle runs uh, runs so much faster. Right, and the, and the other thing about the White House is for the last three years, they have been the, the big banana. And you know, this is you know, I mean, I think they're still begin they're still recovering from they're still learning that that um, they're going to have to deal with Kerry every day. I mean, for a long time, Bush has been the most important politician in the land. He still is, of course. But, you know, for a long time it was, well, you, how can you say that about the president? You know, he's the president. There's this, there's this in indignation, and I think now they're beginning to realize, hey, he's a, also a political candidate in addition to being president. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I, I thought uh, I would go back and uh, give you a, um, 
uh, comparison from early in the uh, in the 20th century of a reporter who covered the White House. He's generally thought of as one of the uh, first White House reporters, William Price, um, who was one of the organizers of the White House Correspondents Association. And in 1902, um, when the the Washington the Evening Star had its 50th anniversary. Um, everybody wrote about their beat and how it had changed. And he talked about how he gets information from the White House, and this is 1902. Um, as a matter of fact, the news secured at the White House is nearly always the result of the efforts of the newspaper men themselves. It is generally not the policy of either the President or his Secretary to make public any information. A hint of a story must be found before either will talk. Appointments and similar official changes are made public, but there is no giving out of prepared news. So reporters and correspondents have to find it themselves. And uh, so what they then do is, um, is get a tip or the same friends develop the story for them and sometimes it's a question of hard digging, as the miner puts it, to unravel the story. And you were talking about digging too. Yeah, I'd love to hear that because, yeah. you know, I was, <laughs> I was you know, thinking the good old days and I was, it was uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was president, right? 1902, right? That's right. Yeah, in the good old days, you always imagined that you know the president was just calling reporters into the Oval Office. You, know, you see these pictures in the in the West Wing lobby, and you think, God, isn't that amazing? You know, there are the reporters all just hanging out in the Oval o Office, and uh, so that's nice to hear that it, you know, it wasn't that great, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, Roosevelt did uh, talk to reporters, but yeah. um, he had in those people he wanted, and if you displeased him in some way. <laughs> <laughs> then you were not allowed to come in. And so Price talks about uh, yeah. the getting tips. And he said, you know, he, he might have gotten the same story that the president gave him, um, but he, uh, that he was ha to have off the record. He might have gotten it some other way, but he felt he couldn't use it because the president would think that he was, uh, he was breaking a confidence and he couldn't run that risk. So they were always worried about what their relationships were. But they did get those off-the-record sessions. Um, uh, Dan Bartlett last week was talking about off-the-record sessions and, and uh, that he wanted to have sessions with the president so that people would get to know him as a, as a person. Um, but it's diff difficult to keep those on the, uh, off the record as the recent session with um, five uh, uh, television uh, correspondents from all the networks. Um, what do you think of those kinds of sessions? Have you had one yourself? We have not. So far, it's only been with the networks. Uh, there's talk of one with the newspapers. I mean, I'm, I'm a mixed, uh, it's a mixed bag for us. I mean, in previous administrations, uh, I think when Reagan, I can remember, the, why the New York Times boycotted one of these sessions and said, if it's not on the record, we're not going. Well, you know, I think you should go because you find stuff out. And, and unlike this reporter, I mean, if, if the president said something and then I could chase around and get it someplace else, I would use it, of course. Uh -huh. So I think, and you get an insight into the president. Um, I don't know what the, um, the problem with, I don't know what, so I think they're basically useful, but you get in, you can get yourself tied into a bind. And the other thing is, especially now, there's no off the record in Washington. And so I don't really think the president is going to totally level with the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, the Wall Street Journal, whoever they would have in there for this off the record session. You know, I don't think any, uh, any uh, intel <laughs> intelligent person would ever uh, really tell us, tell us uh, something uh, Terrific and you know, truthful. I mean, uh, I, I mean, I'm just saying. I, I don't think the, the, the president's still going to be really careful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's, not, it's unrealistic in a way because uh, reporters are then going to go out and talk to each other. Oh yeah, especially if news is committed. Like yeah. say uh, during the Clinton administration, uh, when the president had an off-the-record session with a group of reporters in in Austin and talked about the um, uh, the earning power that Hillary Clinton would uh, would have. Uh, how many million dollars she would be able to earn. There was a financial analysis, and he said if she didn't run for the Senate, you know, I had this financial analysis said she would earn, I think it was $20 million. And uh, I can't remember, uh, you know, it was five-year period. Yeah. So that ended up, of course, that yeah. ended up uh, in, in the news. Um, nobody in that session used it, but several people gave it to, uh, to right. a reporter, to Ken Bazinet, who then – who then did use it in uh, the New York Daily News. So it, it does seem unrealistic right. that nothing is really uh, um, off the record. Um, 
What do you find are the, the, the advantages of being at the White House, of the White House beat? <laughs> what do you like about it? What are the disadvantages? Uh, well, let's see. Oh, I think you've gotten a few <laughs> of the disadvantages. Uh, what are the advantages? Let's see. Should I just look at you now? Or I, I, either, I don't know. I'll look at you. It doesn't make any difference. Um, what, I, what are the advantages? Um, well, it's a, it's you know, it's a, it's a big deal. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, um, uh, it's you're in the center. You're absolutely in the center of things. Everything I write about is in, almost everything is important. Um, about uh, you know, most of it is interesting. About thirty percent of it is absolutely riveting. I mm -hmm. feel like I've engaged on the really big issues of the country, you know, in the world. Um, uh, a lot, some of it's very exciting, you know, the foreign travel, and I, mm -hmm. you know, I was in Aqaba and Jordan when there was the summit between, mm -hmm. uh, that now has fallen to pieces, yeah, but, right. but it seemed very important at the time last June when we were all there, and the Bush thought he was making peace in the Middle East, you know, another president led down that path, but, um, but, um, so I like that part of it, um, I like, it's a funny thing to say, I, don't, I, I like, um, I don't work at the White House, I work at, I mean, the, the New York Times Bureau, uh, Washington Bureau is a few blocks away just on the other side of Lafayette Park, but I'm at the White House a lot, and I like, it's a funny thing to say, I like being at the White House, I think, I love it as a, as a building, and as mm -hmm. a, it's a very beautiful, interesting place to be, mm -hmm. I mean, I just, I like, it's a funny thing. I like walking in there in the mornings. It's mm -hmm. always pretty and it's always interesting. And I like it as a, it's to me the White House as as, as an institution, as a home, as a museum, you know, as a, as a pu somewhat public place, um, as a workplace is fascinating. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I find that really interesting. Uh, you know, this sort of upstairs downstairs aspect of it, plus the fact that there's, it's so small. You wow. know, really, and and. And it's got there's there's such stories in that building, and I go there almost mm -hmm. every day, you know, and um, and uh, that's you know, and I guess it's um, that's what I like about it. I guess. Am I leaving anything else? I I can't think of anything no, else. There's a lot of downsides. Um, I was just thinking that when you're um, when you walk into it, and yeah. um, uh, and you're thinking about the White House as a whole. So mm -hmm. in a way, you're thinking about more than the, than the president. Is that something yeah. of a reminder that your beat is more than just covering the president? Sure. But that it's a covering the, uh, the institution of the presidency and covering right. the, the staff. Yeah, and yeah, exactly, because it's, it's a big, broad beat. Um, and, um, you know, when you go back, and I was just reading about previous presidential elections. You know, I did a piece over the weekend for the Week Interview on on negative campaigning, which yeah. and they've been negative for 200 years, yeah. and this one is like nothing yet. Forget it. This is like, you know, kindergarten. Um, but when you go back and you read about this stuff, and you it just is, it, you realize this is a great thing to cover. I mean, this is interesting, and uh -huh. and and uh, and also when you walk into the East Room and you realize, I think that's where Lincoln laid in state. Mm -hmm. And you l think about just this country. I mean, it's a wonderful thing to cover. Uh, uh, you know, if yeah. you step back, on a lot of days, it's completely agonizing and maddening uh -huh. and frustrating. It's true. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I was thinking on the, on the yeah. East Room, that's the, um, that's the place where um, uh, President um, Jefferson uh, uh, talked to Meriwether Lewis. Right, and that's, um, I think and Mary was teaching him. That was where Meriwether Lewis had a, I think they had split it up into some offices mm -hmm. for Meriwether Lewis. I mean, think about that. I walk in there yeah. a lot, you know, and, and um, that's amazing, you know, yeah. and, and I guess, um, so I like, I like that part of it. Uh huh. What are some of the downsides? Well, those are a lot. I mean, <laughs> the, um, uh, the downsides are that you're in a very sh you're in the bubble. It's very hard to do anything original, and you're on a very short leash with the office. I mean, I th I, in terms of being original, it's very easy to be a mediocre White House correspondent. It is very hard to be a good one, because in terms of being, it's easy because there's a lot of sort of given page one stories. You know, the president hiccups, and it's often on page one, especially after 9/11. You know, you can cover a presidential speech, and you don't have to do a particularly good job, and it lands right on the as a lead of the paper. You know, um, so it, unlike this, w the the reporter during Roosevelt's day, um, there is a lot of news they kind of hand out, and yeah. you can just put it in the paper, and 
you're in the paper a lot and it looks like you're doing an okay job. I mean, not at the New York Times. They don't think that's an okay job. But um, so that's the downside. It's just the, the – it's so constricted. And you can't um, – I sometimes feel like I miss being a reporter, you know, because uh, you can't wander loose in the West Wing. You know, mm -hmm. we're pretty res we're restricted, as you know, to the press office and just up to the press secretary's office. You can't wander loose in the White House. Um, uh, the uh, it's very hard to get st real stuff out of people, you know, in the White House. And so you go to the Hill and you go to look for, you know, it, it it's just a hard beat to be distinctive in and to do s and to and to and to um to control really uh-huh how do you come up with um uh the kinds of things that you do because okay. you have a mix a mixture of, uh, of of enterprise and of daily reporting right how do you come up with them there are three of you that cover the beat well we just <laughs> i don't know it's kind of a um Fairly informal. I mean, David Sanger covers more foreign policy, and he covers really national security. Mm -hmm. He covers, and um, and I tend, and there was just two of us for a while, and now we added a third because it became overwhelming. Um, and then Dick and I do more politics and domestic stuff, although we do do the foreign trips. Um, uh, you know, if you come up with an idea, it's yours, and then you do it. A lot of times, they come out of New York, out of the editors in New York. I'm working on wow now one. A story I did now that came straight from the editor in New York, so that has to get done immediately. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> they get, tend to get higher priority than the others, than your ideas. Um, but um, a lot of times it's just you know, Sarah did. I mean, the, I, I did a uh, story in the Today's paper yeah. about President Bush time, presidential time, right. and I got that idea last week sitting at. A, I mean, I have to write those every Monday, so I'm always right. thinking about what am I going to do. But um, I got that idea sitting at the briefing last Tuesday. When um, bu when there was a back and forth about there was a lot of very contentious questions from the reporters to Scott about um, would the president testify to the 9/11 Commission mm -hmm. and it, would he go more than an hour you know and Scott said well uh, he said he's going to testify for an hour but he's going to answer all the questions and he couldn't here's an example of the message of the day Scott could not you know it took an 45 minutes to get Scott said he's only going to testify for an hour but he's going to answer all the questions and we said Scott you can't have it both ways and we went yeah. back and forth and around and around and we got nowhere but during that around and around I started thinking about time how uh -huh. does the president use his time because it was this big thing this is an hour out of the president's day this is a very big deal and that's when I got the and of course John Kerry had said which had prompted the whole thing if the president has time to go to a rodeo he should have more time than just an hour for the 9-11 commission yeah um, well, it's, it was a very interesting piece in, in your uh, discussion about his meetings, and, and I was wondering, in uh, looking at the way they use time, as to what they use it for. Um, yeah, for I didn't example, get into it, what yeah. are those? What are those meetings for? What role do meetings play for him as far as uh, the decisions that he makes? Um, a lot of different things. Um, there, uh, I can tell you. Let's see, things I know specifically, like on when they were um, on Medicare, the Medicare bill and the prescription drug bill last fall. I talked. the The role for meetings for this president, because they're never more than forty five minutes, is to get a quick update from the staff on where we are in a certain issue, let's say prescription drugs, okay, mm -hmm. or Medicare, of uh, so, uh, some bill on the Hill. And boom, 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 you've got to come in. And everyone I've talked to says the same thing. You know, this uh, Paula Neal aside, that's another issue, that's cabinet meetings. But and these sort of smaller meetings in the Oval Office with a small, um, the role, everyone goes around and presents, okay, here's where we are, here's where we are on the Hill, here's where we are with this group, here's where we are with that group. And the president, you know, moves in very quickly to find out, and I've seen him do this, um, okay, uh, to just sort of, he zeroes in and gets the piece of information he needs out of the person. And he'll just, the person will have a 15-minute prepared presentation to Bush, but he'll, you know, he'll, he'll uh -huh. be interrupted right away. And then Bush will make a decision very quickly after listening to all this about, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're now going to, I want you to do this, this, and this, and I want it, I want it done tomorrow. You know, and so it's more of a CEO kind of thing. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of discussion about ideas or maybe we should do this, maybe we should, we should do that. I mean, that might that probably goes on earlier, but the ones that I've seen, um, it's it's moving toward getting information quickly and then moving toward action based on the information. Mm -hmm.
um, there's not a lot of, um, he's very decisive. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of second guessing or what about this, what about that. Uh -huh. How does it compare, for example, I mean, during the, um, the Reagan period, um, were you able to get some sense of uh, how, how Reagan made decisions? You know, I didn't cover. role in meetings? Uh, that's a really good question. I didn't cover Reagan. I was a, I was a reporter for the, I mean, I covered him to the extent that I yeah. covered the administration. I was a style section reporter for the Washington Post, and I did a lot of profiles of White House officials, mm -hmm. and you know, like Deaver and, you know, that Larry Speaks, I remember. Uh, yeah, Speaks and stuff. And so I didn't really cover that part of the White House. And I don't know the answer to that. I, do mm -hmm. you know the answer? Do you have any idea? Um, uh, no, I couldn't I, I, I mean, I think he was less engaged, but that I'm not sure. Ex that was the view. I don't I know if they, I know it the myself. The meetings were longer, and, and, yeah. uh, uh, there were, and maybe there were, there's more information that was coming up in them because uh, most uh, political people seem to like to get information verbally. Um, yeah. A lot of them do. Carter didn't, but uh, Clinton seems to, because they are uh, people who, as politicians, uh, enjoy dealing with other people, yeah. and not I'll necessarily reading. Yeah. Um, um, Mark McKinnon in uh, Ken Oletta's piece, um, uh, there's a quote from him that's the kicker in the story. Uh, yeah, I know that in quote. The story. <laughs> yeah, that, the, that the White House press corps is, <laughs> is lost in the dust of, inter of internet <laughs> and cable. And uh, um, I wondered, uh, you know, what, what do you think of that? Well, not much. I mean, I saw Mark after that, and I said, you know, I, <laughs> I, I mean, I just, I just disagree. Well, obviously, I disagree. I think yeah. that we're, that we're totally, yeah, that we're the totally washed up White House press corps. I mean, that's been said about the White House press corps for a long time. This is probably William Price's. Time. Yeah, right. But <laughs> I have to tell you, I mean, this is going to be seem a little arrogant, but I, I think. I don't feel that working for the New York Times that I'm irrelevant or washed uh -huh. up or in the dustbin, you know. I feel like um, uh, what I uh, write gets, you know, raked over with a fine-tooth comb by this White House. They, comp they certainly are reacting to it, you know, mm -hmm. not always positively. <laughs> but and, um, you know, I, I don't feel that myself. I feel like, and, and the, the letters I get from readers and the email and the phone calls is so intense. I mean, it's just amazing. And um, I, I don't feel that at all. I feel like everything I do is read and scrutinized and argued over and complained about, you know, mm -hmm. not praised very uh -huh. often. And I also think that that quote, um, I think it, while it, um, it probably got Mark a lot of points at the White House, um, I just don't think it's... I haven't it's found anybody at the White House who agreed with you. Well, I didn't think it's, it, it, it's just the, stu the article by Ken completely um, belied what Mark said because if you look at what they actually do all day, they spend an awful lot of time worrying about what's uh -huh. in the press. Uh -huh. the, the morning, sta the, the senior staff meeting at 7.30 is all about, well, what's in the papers. Plus, we talked about that giant, you know, the giant White House uh, clipping service they get. Plus, after the 7.30 staff meeting, there's a, co a whole communications meeting about how we're going to deal with the, the press. I, I mean, the whole thing, um, well, that's good that people at the White House didn't agree with it. Because <laughs> well, 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 last week, um, uh, Dan talked about the importance of the New York Times. Oh, well, I'd love to I'd like to hear what he said because they're always complaining about us. <laughs> well, they, they take you very seriously, not only for for what you do, but for the way that you move yeah. news elsewhere. Yeah. And so that um, he was talking about the importance of the Times in setting the agenda for the television networks. Right. So that it's not just that you know that uh, you're writing to your particular audience of readers but that you're shaping uh, what television is doing as well. Yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if the TV, I think TV might say that, but uh, I certainly know people have said to me that be, as television has cut back on staffing, that, so, you know, the newspapers, I won't say just the Times, the Washington Post is certainly in the mix, as is the Journal and the other, you know, national papers, uh -huh. um, that they use the papers almost as assignment mm -hmm. editors in a funny way. I mean, they've mm -hmm. got their own, but, yeah. you know, I just... It's nice that Dan said that because God, did they complain about us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, uh, uh, I mean, when you think about it, it's really the White House press corps that's writing uh, is writing the first cut, the contemporary yeah. cut yeah. of uh, history, because it is the press corps that is uh, writing about the policy, writing about the presidential actions. Um, 
they have a lot of interest in the local press corps, but um, uh, last week one of the, uh, the points uh, that we were making was, uh, I, I remember being in College Station, Texas, when the energy plan came out and the College Station Eagle wrote about uh, the energy plan, I mean, it was in the right. paper, and the author of that was Terry Hunt <laughs> of Associated Press. So yeah. here you yeah, have the College Station Eagle depending on somebody who's not 100 yards from the Oval Office. And that is always going to be, that's, that's right. been the case and it continues as much as, as the Ford administration, Nixon administration, Carter, all of them were interested in uh, the out-of-town press that for really the definition of what's happening in a White House, that is that White House press corps that's right there. Um, so I, I was surprised by that <laughs> quote from Mark McKinnon, but I thought it's, uh, it's kind of uh, it's a fun one to, uh, to <laughs> yeah. deal with anyway. Um, uh, in, um, uh, in looking at, at your role, it seems that you have more flexibility than a lot of White House reporters do because you have that uh, your column right. that you can write yeah. about. To what extent do you get to do whatever you really are interested in doing? Well, through that column, I do. I mean, mm -hmm. it was, I, I don't understand how, I mean, it, it, it uh, uh, I don't, um, I'm sorry, I'm really glad I have it. You know, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's hard, you know, because it ruins my weekends. <laughs> you know, yeah. I have to come up with an idea every week, but it's a great, um, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm given more voice in that than I get in my, in the newspaper. I mean, I sometimes find that, you know, after writing one of those, I then write a news story with a little more life to it and it always gets taken out I, then I just put it in the column on you know? <laughs> but um, I, I uh, it, the idea came from uh, out of all people Hal Raines I mean he uh -huh. uh, it was during the uh, when we were running the um, when we had the nation challenge section that we ran right. um, uh -huh. after the uh, during the uh, after September 11th and during the war in Afghanistan uh, we had a lot of pages to fill, and as the war <laughs> was winding down, <laughs> that we had less, it was harder to fill that section, you know. And yeah. so um, Hal said, would you like to write this thing on Mondays for the Nation Challenge, and we'll put it on the second page. And and so I did that. And then Johnny Apple, another, you know, uh, illustri really illustrious Times reporter, uh, also wrote, he wrote a letter from Washington. I did White House letter, and he did a letter from Washington. And um, anyway, after the section stopped, you know, I th early 2002, I guess it was, or late, um, uh, I kept it, I mean, they said, do you want to keep it going? And I said, yeah. I said, but I don't want to do it Mondays because it ruins my Sunday. They said, no, you have to do it Monday, so I don't know. So I uh -huh. do it Mondays, and it's, uh -huh. I kept it up. How do you come up with ideas? Well, it's hard. I mean, sometimes uh, I'm, <laughs> you know, on Friday, you know, usually by Friday I have to know what's going on because I have to do the reporting for it. Um, uh, before the weekend, it's very hard to reach people yeah. on a weekend unless it's a major news story, you know. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's today's Monday. I'm not worrying too much about next week's, but I start worrying on Tuesday. Okay. I, I I try and do stuff that's topical. Um, it's off the news. I mean, I I mean, I realize it's important real estate in the New York Times. I mean, it's you know, it's in the back of the A section, but it's still the New York Times, and so I feel like I've been given this space. It's there no matter what. I mean, that's a great honor in a in a way in this business. So um, it better be good, you know. And so I better impart information. It mm -hmm. better be stuff that is interesting, that I work to get, and not just me sort of yammering on about something you know mm -hmm. it's, I feel that you know it has to have value so um, I have some ideas for next week I'm not sure a lot of times <coughs> I kind of wait to see how the week is shaping up and sometimes I do it if there's a theme for the week I mean um, last week it was obvious it was time the week before that it was Bush getting into the campaign mm -hmm. sometimes I do it on a person you know I, it's uh -huh. hard to do 800 words but I do it when re thinking, you're talking about uh, how hard it is to kind of get to the person of the president. <coughs> One of the ways in the, in the past that it's been important, um, an opportunity to get to who that person is as president or presidential press conferences. What do you find uh, their use are, uh, the, the major uses are of the press conferences? And, um, and uh, do you think that um, they should have more of them? <laughs> yeah, do want, here, here, do you want one of these? Um, uh, well, sure, they should have more. Um, well, you know, I mean, I don't think press conferences tell you very much about that much about the president. I do think what's their use? Their use is, um, you know, uh, making news. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm less, um, 
up in arms and my other colleagues at the White House about that there are not enough. I mean, there aren't enough, but I don't think that they tell you that much about the presidency. Uh -huh. I mean, they they get you a page one story, and they get some news. They drive some news, but uh -huh. that's usually because the White House wants to make news. I mean, the president is perfectly capable of getting up there and not not making news. I mean, they know he knows what he's doing. Uh -huh. You know those press conferences. So, um, so I, uh, but I mean, I get. I guess it's good for the public to get a look at the president and to see how he handles. You know, this president, especially that half of the country, you know. <laughs> That doesn't support him, thinks that he he's, I mean, doesn't think he's very smart, you know. So I it's I think it's good for him to get up there and answer questions in a live setting. I mean, he's he can be. He, I think he's quite good at it actually. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not one of those people who doesn't think he's. I mean, I think he's quite smart. But I, I'm amazed when I you know talk to him. Mean, you must hear this yourself, you know, mm -hmm. that. Um, so I think it's good to see the president in a, in that setting, and in you know especially you know he had a press conference which the uh, right before the war started last year in early March, about a week or so before the war started, that I thought we the White House press corps got trashed for that because we were right. perceived as east, east perceived yeah. as lap dogs and much too easy <laughs> on the president. And we can talk about that if you want to. Um, but I but I think it was good for the country to to see its leader. Uh, Standing up, you know, in prime time, live, taking questions, uh, when he was about to take us into war. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a good thing to. D I mean, it's a democracy. It's good to have that. Yeah, yeah. There was a perception. That, yeah. Uh, that <laughs> well, we can talk about it if you want. <laughs> I have my own version of that. But, <laughs> um, but I I in a way, it's it's uh, uh, it wasn't in your hands. Uh, no. You can ask questions, but um, but how can you uh, end up? Uh, Pressing a president to a point oh. that he's going to give an answer that he doesn't want to give, and you're you're completely at a disadvantage in those press conferences. As you just there's just no way. He, I mean, he's got he's got all the advantages of being the president, of of um, having the really the sympathy of the audience, and um, you can't push him too hard, or it becomes a th it becomes a story about you. Mm -hmm. As I've learned, I did the. Um, I was <laughs> a panelist in the in, a, in the Democratic right. debate up in New York. The last, actually, the last Democratic debate between right. uh, four candidates left: Sharpton, Kucinich, Kerry, and Edwards. And I was told by CBS and the New York Times to be very aggressive and to interrupt. And we don't want to hear their stump speeches anymore. And we want this lively. We want this New York. Well, you. You can't imagine the email I got about being obnoxious and overbearing and insulting and, uh, you know, just I should be fired. And, um, you know, life goes on and, you know. <laughs> but um, the point is I would never do that in a press conference. I mean, you just would be excoriated and it wouldn't be about the president. It would be uh -huh. about you. Yeah. And so when we were so criticized for that press conference during the war, I mean, I was criticized actually for saying Mr. President. It was like, what am I supposed to call him? That's the, that's the what we do. But people were so hyped up about how polite we all were and how deferential. And the, I think the country was, there was such tension and anger in the country right before that war started that all came out on us. Uh -huh. But I also think, I have to tell you, when I, I think we were very deferential because, you know, in the East Room press conference, it's live, it's very um, intense. It's it's frightening to stand up there. I mean, think about it. You're standing up on prime time live television, asking the president of the United States a question. And when the country's about to go to war, there was a very serious, um, somber tone that evening, and I think it made, and I, you know, nobody wanted to get into an argument with the president mm -hmm. at this very serious time. And it was very. It had a very heavy feeling of history to it. That mm -hmm. press conference. Yeah. Do you think that there is some, uh, there's sometimes confusion about uh, what role the press has, that uh, people criticize yeah. the uh, press in a sense as if the press is the opposition? And so as if we're the Democrats, and, right. And, yeah. uh, so in a lot of ways, I mean, they have, the, the Bush White House has benefited from not having a very effective opposition for a, uh, a large uh, amount of their uh, presidency. Right. I mean, now there, there's less of that, obviously, because they've got a really yeah. strong opposition in Kerry. But, but for yes, especially for the war. Let's for John Kerry voted for the war. I mean, the, yeah. the Congress was largely behind the president for that war. And the people who were angry about the war um, uh, felt, yeah, you're absolutely right, that it was they beat up on us. Why aren't you stopping this? So it's not my role. Right. 
you know, and I believe me, I, I saw what happens when you come, you come on way too, you know, you come on too strong in a, with, with, uh, with a politician mm -hmm. on television. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of the, uh, one of the issues that's come up, um, that, that we were talking about actually before our session began, uh, about the president is his newspapers. Does he read newspapers? Oh. <laughs> and so you have some people, you know, have uh, been interviewed, staff people say, no, 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 he doesn't read newspapers. And then uh, in your interview with the first lady, um, it, it, uh, it seemed that maybe one of the, th the points that, um, they wanted to get across with that interview was oh, well, the point that um, indeed they do uh, you read know, newspapers. Maybe they did, but I have to say I asked that question as an afterthought at the end. Oh, by the way, as I was walking out, he reads the paper. Does he read the papers? And she said, you know, so this notion that she had planned to say that. I mean, I asked. I don't think uh -huh. she would have said it if I hadn't asked. I really think that because I was walking out. Uh -huh. And um, of course he reads the papers. He's always read the papers. I mean, before he was president, he read the papers. Um, uh, I know he reads the New York Times, not every word, and you can't actually read the New York Times and every word and be a productive member of society, you know, it's not enough time, but, yeah. but, um, uh, yeah, he, uh, I think, I think, I think he reads them like a lot of really busy people read them. Um, I think in the morning he gets, she, I mean, Mrs. Bush told me, um, I don't think I put this in the story, she said they get the New York Times, the Washington Post, um, the uh, Wall Street Journal, Wall Street Journal, uh, the Dallas. They get the Dallas paper, the Texas papers. They get them late. Um, USA Today, the Washington Times. You know the basic uh -huh. papers we all right. get in Washington, and um, they read them in bed with coffee, and then I think they read them over breakfast. And no, he doesn't read every story. I don't read every story. There's a lot of stories I don't have to read. Mm -hmm. You know. And um, a lot of times when he's given a speech, I don't think he would need to read that story. He knows what he said, you know, and maybe he's reading it for any kind of, you know, I, I, but I think what happened was, and Ari Fleischer always told me he read the papers, uh -huh. you know, yeah. and I used to be able to tell when Ari would call and say, you know, Ari used to call and say the president's really un un unhappy, this is wrong in your story, and it was like, buried in the story. And I don't think Ari was making it up that the president was unhappy. I don't think Ari would have bothered to call me about that. And, um, and, and I think that what happened was last summer, uh, the president had a bunch of reporters over to the ranch in, to, at the end of the summer in Crawford. I wasn't there at this. I wasn't in this thing. But he, in, in that session or in this little uh -huh. barbecue, he told a bunch of reporters that he, he didn't read the papers. And I think, I think, <laughs> I think he was just doing, I think, he meant it like I don't. You guys aren't that important in my life, you know. I don't. Uh -huh. You know. I. Uh, you know. I don't need to read. You don't need. You don't. There's nothing you write that can tell me anything. And, you know, Mrs. Bush later backpedaled with me and said, "Well, what he meant was he doesn't read everything, and he doesn't read the columnists. You know, the uh, the ones that are being up on him. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. and he, um, which may or may not be true. But um, I believe her. I believe Ari. I believe. Uh -huh. I, I just. I just. Uh, um, it doesn't make sense that he doesn't read the papers. Maybe he reads them less now than he used to, because mm -hmm. he's got you know summaries and stuff. Um, how um, how do you hear from the White House when the president's unhappy? You, you mentioned you get, you get press there. secretary calls or you, Scott will call. Uh huh. But they call you. Do they do they ever call your editor? Um, or they just call. They you? usually call me, and then I don't think I'm trying to think what they they usually call me and complain, and then you know uh, I'm trying to think if they've ever called the editor. No. What kinds of things do they complain about? Little, funny little things, you know, little things. Um, uh, they once got really mad about something I wrote about the president and God. And it was early on. It was after nine, right after 9-11. And I made some comment that I thought I wrote something that I'd heard from a really good close friend that the I can't remember how I phrased it, but it was something about how the president thought that God was testing him or something. It was it was a very mainstream thought. Mm -hmm. You know how you say that God never gives you more than you can. You know how yeah, religious. Right. You know, you know it was very standard. God doesn't give you more than you can handle, or, or, um, you know, God had given. It, it was pretty. I thought pretty um, homogenized. I didn't think it was uh -huh. really out there. And um, but the White House got so angry because they thought I was saying that Bush thought he was, you know, appointed by God or that, uh -huh. you know, God had, you know, it, it was, so they got very angry about that. Other things like, uh, 
uh, I mean, Scott got mad at me about something he said in a, I, the way I characterized something he said in a briefing. Um, there was little, it's funny little things. One time I, oh, I told you earlier, we, um, there was a, I did a story, uh, and we wrote that, um, it was a double byline story and the other reporter had written that the stock market went down after a presidential speech, but actually it went up. It was kind of a bad mistake. Uh, and so, uh, but since my name was first on the story, they came after me and uh -huh. Scott was on my case because it was, uh, for a week for a correction. Mm -hmm. And I, I was pretty sure it wasn't just Scott driving that. You know, I think it just irritated. I, I don't know. Uh -huh. So that's how they tell you. Uh -huh. um, uh, well, I'll just see if we, I think maybe what we can do now is go into uh, to questions. Oh, we okay. Some questions from <laughs> you're Pallison. All, and all, you're all still awake. <laughs> <laughs> no one has seemed to have inspired. No one seems to have inspired any questions. I was going to say yes, but before we do that, um, when you were uh, covering in the Reagan administration, did you hear from people then? I mean, from the White House. Oh yeah, they would complain. Would they complain? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The same kind of thing. Yeah, but not. I I had no sense. I don't think Reagan was read the papers actually. I mean, I do you think? I don't know about that, but I had no sense that he. I don't have the, at all the sense that he was as engaged in that in the in the press give and take as as Bush is. Uh huh. But you would hear more from the chief, of, you know, the press people. They get very angry. Mm hmm. Um. Do you hear from anybody other than uh? Than well, Dan ca Dan calls to complain about stuff. Uh huh. But you wouldn't hear from uh, say you know other senior people like no. Andy Carr. No, no, that would be beneath him to call and complain. <laughs> <laughs> really, <laughs> Jim Baker? Did, did Jim Baker do it? I don't remember him doing it to me. Dick Darman really complained to me once. Uh -huh. but he was he was deputy chief of staff. He got very angry about something I wrote. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> but that was uh, that was it. Um, what do you do when um, uh, when you get uh, get complaints uh, from them? Well, how do you weather? How do you weather? Well, I like to um, think that I'm uh, I'm not always uh, as well behaved as I should be. Um, you know, the best thing to say is is to listen and let them vent and then just say, you know, you have a really good point and I, I take your point, but here's why I wrote that or uh -huh. whatever. And uh, Scott was on me recently about a correction he wanted for um, some of the National Guard coverage. Mm -hmm. And it was actually, this was really about Scott, it wasn't about the president. And Scott was mad because I had written um, that he hadn't answered the question. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't remember now all the details, but he was angry that I hadn't. And I said, well, you didn't answer the question. And he said, well, that's just your characterization of it. You know, I answered it the way I wanted to answer it. So he sort of went round and around. And, and uh, finally he, um, but I just said, Scott, I don't even know what I would write as a correction. I mean, there's no factual error here. He just didn't like the characterization of it. So I said, let me take it to the editors. So I took it to the editors, and I said, here's the transcript. Here's what I wrote. I don't think it needs a correction. And I told Scott, you know, um, they're taking a look at it. And I was really nice, and th we'll get back to you. And um, actually, I never did. We just it just died. Uh -huh. We never ran it. What didn't deserve a correction at all? One uh, one uh, thing, is, and this is kind of often another mm -hmm. uh, another area, um, to get a sense of what the White House beak is, is like, to compare it with what other kinds of beats were. Like when you were in India and when you were in, uh, in Tokyo, when you were putting together daily journalism with enterprise reporting, um, how did you do that? What were some of the things? Um, in India and Japan? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, India and Japan were a little different because I was, um, I was there on contract for the Washington Post, so I had very little, I didn't really have much daily yeah, responsibilities. Uh -huh. It was very, I mean, I did really good stories there because I had a lot of time and yeah. I could, you know, take a week or two on a story and I traveled a lot. So, but I mean, I did do some spot news and so you just, you just try and mm -hmm. mix it up. You're always, um, you know, you cover the spot news because it's, it happens, you can't control it. But whenever, while you're doing that, you're always working on a, on a longer term project, which I kind of, can't, I kind of always am anyway. That's sort of how you do it is if you cover a beat that you do the daily, but then you also have a, 
you know, have a couple of longer term things in your pocket that you're working on mm -hmm. at any given time right now. I'm, I'm, you know, we're, I have to, I'm supposed to go to, um, Fort Campbell, Kentucky with Bush on Thursday. I'm also worrying about, you know, shorter term project, which is what I'm supposed to write for my white house letter. Plus I'm worrying about a story that the times wants me to write for Wednesday. I don't know how I'm going to do it about Bush and his transition to a candidate from president. And, um, you know, so there's like about so there's like two other things I'm working on. You know, it's just you're always I've got a lot of balls in the air at any given time. Uh huh. And that's probably more so than in other beats. Right. It's much mm -hmm. more so. It used to drive me crazy. I've just gotten used to it. When I was in the style section, I was always doing you know I, in the spot stories would be like parties or you know art openings or something. Plus, I was doing longer term profiles, and it was very but I would get very admired into a profile or to you know it would take two weeks or three weeks to do if it was a big long profile of somebody and it would be very hard to get out of that and do something else because mm -hmm. I my head would be in this in this direction and I just have given up that I don't have that luxury anymore I'm just constantly pulled in all directions uh -huh. and in a way that mirrors um, what happens within a White House that uh, White House staff have to work on so many different things right. and it's also a no mistakes kind of environment you have a lot of different things to do, and you know that you can't mista make mistakes. At the same time, you know people are, are are going to, and so there's just an enormous amount of pressure. And so what that what that it usually ends up with uh, for White House officials is um, not long tenure. Right. Um, they say it had, like right. uh, Ari Fleischer. Well, what about reporting? It's in, the same in a way. You have the same yeah. kinds of things. It's the same thing. I mean, the, <coughs> the st I mean, the, in the Clinton administration, the the standard length of time for any Times reporter covering that White House was about two years, and people really burned out on that beat because partly it was the, just the hours, and the shortly in yeah. the last few years, the pressures of Monica Lewinsky and all that. But um, it's certainly true of this beat too. I find. One of the hardest things is the, uh, you're right, you can never be wrong. You can't make mistakes. And the range of topics that I have to know about covering the White House is just enormous. You know, well, you know what they are. It's, it's all the domestic policy. It's theoretically every country in the world that we right. deal with, which is yeah. all of them. Um, it's, uh, it's politics. It's just, it's just it's one, economy. it's economy. It's yeah. one thing after another. And a lot of times I get hit with them late in the day and it's, you know, it's going on the front page of the Times, and it has to be right. And it just, you're right, the pressure is enormous. And, the, and it's also the hours. What, um, uh, what would be a typical, um, well, let's say a typical week of the kinds of hours? You know, how many days do you work during the week? And, uh, and, and what do you start out doing? Um, we have some sense, uh, for example, I think of how White House officials right. uh, begin a day and, and whatnot, but, um, but reporters, we don't have quite the same. What do you read in the morning, and when do you get up and, and the rest Oh, well, of you, know, you want to hear all this boring? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I've got two kids, that. so I'm up really early. But, um, well, let's see. Usually um, our days start later uh, at the office than the White House does. I mean, we're mm -hmm. always a couple of hours behind the administration <laughs> because they have to do their thing first, and then we have to find out, then we have to cover it, right? But, um, yeah. Um, I'm up really early. I'm up around 5, 5.30 because I go to the gym or I run, and then I have kids I have to get to school. So by the time I get to the office, I've been up for five <laughs> I've been up for five hours. You know, it's just all day's gone. So, um, I mean, today uh, I got in by – I was up at 5.30, and then I came home by, you know, 7. I went to the gym, and then I came home by 7, and then I had to – make lunches and get I drive the carpool for middle school and then I had to come back and I have a live-in nanny so I shouldn't complain too much and then um then I had to uh, get the other my son she actually got him breakfast because I was away driving the carpool and then my husband's in India he covers um Colin Powell that that's mm -hmm. the problem I am a single parent this week mm -hmm. uh, normally I have help at home with, uh, with another person <laughs> he also works for the Times so um and then I, I what happened then I had to walk Teddy to the bus stop and then uh, I came back, and then I drove to the office. And then uh, I got. Would you have read the papers? I haven't read the papers. Uh -huh. so, so where did so where yeah. did I read the papers in there? Nowhere, right? That's what I mean. I think you know, I feel for the president, right? So, I but you know I know how to read the papers. I know to look at. Um, I mean, at the health club, I was lo right, watching yeah. CNN, so I knew that there was no disaster. You know, that's uh -huh. my main thing is you don't want to go into the White House or the office with, you know a huge news story and be totally oblivious to it. <laughs> it's a bad idea. Um, but I knew from CNN watching it, you know, with the crawl that there was nothing going on. Uh -huh. So, um, or nothing much. I knew that the big story was going to be, um, 
was going to be Spain. You could uh-huh. tell that this was a big, and we, which we had already. We had David had the story this morning. David Sanger saying that this was a big problem for Bush mm-hmm. had just lost a big ally. Um, and then there was a there was supposed to be usually on Mondays there's a nine thirty uh, foreign policy meeting at the office where we all talk about what we're doing that week on foreign policy. And there's a ten a.m. Um, domestic policy meeting. Um, I go to both because you know all the yeah. the three White House correspondents go to both. We're the only ones who do. And but meanwhile that was late, so then I went over to the White House for Scott's uh, early gaggle at nine forty five, which was an hour late today. Uh, mm. Scott has been running really late. His early briefing. So I guess that's when I read the paper. You know, everybody was complaining. I thought, great, now I can read the paper. Yeah. So and I that's sat- true with a lot of people. You yeah. see a lot of people reading Yeah, so I the sat paper, there and I read yeah. the paper, and that, that solved that problem. And then Scott had his gaggle, and I went back, and um, I was not. I was hoping not to write a story today because I was coming here. And it's hard to get out at 530 if you're writing a story. And... Um, and I saw instantly that I could avoid writing a story if I, because I saw that there was a, Scott had said a couple, he'd, he'd really trashed Kerry today, which was interesting. He did that from the podium. Mm-hmm. And after saying for weeks that he was not going to make, you know, political right. statements from the White House, there he right. was. So I knew that would go into somebody's story, but it wasn't a story on my own. Cause, and then the other thing was, um, there was, he said stuff about Spain. And mm-hmm. that was going to another story, so, or maybe the same story. So I just sped those quotes to other reporters in the office working on those stories. And then I started working on this other thing about the president and his candidate, which they mm-hmm. won in mm-hmm. 48 hours. I don't see how they're going to get it, but that's what uh-huh. they want. <laughs> and then I came here. Uh-huh. I mean, that's sort of semi-typical. If uh-huh. I'm writing, I'm, I'm there much later. The deadline is theoretically 6.30 for a story, but depending on how big it is, it can go to 7.30 or 8. Uh-huh. So I get home oftentimes at 8.30 or 9. Uh-huh. Might, we have dinner very late. We, uh-huh. call our, we call ourselves the Spanish family of Bethesda <laughs> because, you know, I'm the only fourth grader who eats dinner at 9. <laughs> but, we, I, you know, the kids like to have dinner with us. So, yeah. <laughs> so that, that's, that's my life. And that isn't – if it was a travel day, you know, it means I get up at um, – early. I mean, sometimes it's 4. My record is 3.30. Because I have to be at Andrews Air Force Base so early to fly out either with the president or usually on the press charter. And then, you know, you cover the president on a travel day, and then you're back at sometimes uh-huh. early, sometimes and 11 And then you work on, on the weekend, too. Right. And I, I work every Sunday because I write the columns. So I work a minimum of six days a week. Uh-huh. And it kills me when I have to work Saturday. Like uh, now with the way the schedule is for the Times, we have um, the Sunday paper has – uh, they've expanded the circulation and the reach of the Sunday paper. As a result, uh, if you want, if the time since the Times is now delivering to smaller and smaller cities around the country on Sunday morning, the <laughs> the first deadline for the, that edition, it's called the Bulldog. I don't know why, um, is 9 a.m. Saturday. Uh-huh. So it's really grim when I have had a really long week and then I have I have to write a Sunday story that I haven't written. And I've had a, a pleasant sa- Saturday mornings where I'm up at 5 a.m. again to write a story for a 9 a.m. deadline, mm-hmm. and then they and then if there's they it often will be updated during the day for a three o'clock deadline. You know, so you know there, it's possible to very easily work seven days a week. week. Yeah, that's why people burn out. Yeah, yeah, that's one can certainly <laughs> see that. Plus, you're writing it's about so many different types of uh, right. topic, so many topics. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, the, we haven't even talked about the issue of my comp- my competitors, the Washington Post. They had a mm-hmm. great page one on Saturday. I mean, I was thinking, you know, and so then you've got that problem, which is the Post has had this and we didn't have it. So you've got that pressure on you, uh-huh. not just the ways. I mean, I don't work in, a, in this vacuum. I work. I work with a lot of competition, uh-huh. you know. Uh-huh. But and then the happens, editors get upset. You know? But that happens to a lot of other people. Right. They say, well, you know, the Times has, uh, right. has this. Uh-huh. But it happens to us uh-huh. a lot, you know. Uh-huh. I mean, unfortunately, and the Saturday was a really bad day. The uh-huh. Post had a lot of good stories. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And they get, you know, I don't know. I don't know how our editors are not relaxed about that. Um, it's part of the thing of the Times that we should have every story. I don't know how much the Post gets in trouble if we have a story that they think they should have. I don't. I don't. I don't have a sense that it's as bad over there when uh-huh. they miss a story. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. You should ta- ask them. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I see. Right. Larry had. Uh, yeah. Larry had a question. Larry's the uh, director of the Washington Center. He's a political scientist <laughs> who uh, who writes uh-huh. about decision making. He's written about Lyndon Johnson in Vietnam. Spending all my time 
answering questions from reporters on Vietnam and Iraq. So, but I'm not going to ask that question. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about the president as candidate for mm -hmm. a second. This has been a great interview. And as I emailed Martha on uh, Sunday night, I thought your piece on Sunday in the Times was just fantastic. Oh, thanks. Negative, the, uh, the negative. Uh, negative uh, Another reason to be driven mad. That was, uh, you know, they were torturing me until 11 o'clock at night on that one. But on the, on the president as candidate, uh, this morning uh, I heard uh, Evan Thomas and Don Imus talking about Mrs. Bush being very upset at, and actually uh, at the committee that the uh, the president's reelection committee's inability to basically present the president as a human being, uh, the inability of the uh, to get the message of who the president is out there, and they're very concerned about uh, the way it's looking right now. And I was struck by two things you said today. I've been struck by a lot. Mm -hmm. Everything you said has been really interesting. But uh, you, like four of my friends who have gotten to know the president, have said – I, I can't tell you I know that. <laughs> well, but when they have met him <laughs> – Yeah, I've met him. Yeah, of course. When they have met talk him, to him. Uh, they, they all come away with the following impression. He's – uh, a lot brighter than anyone yeah, thought he was. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, he's very engaging. Right. He's very personable. Right. He can have conversations with people. Yet, as you note, uh, this is a White House that can't get off their talking points, mm -hmm. doesn't let you really get to know the president, and is basically too controlled. And I'm wondering, uh, uh, do you think this can last? Uh, that is uh, – oh, Who's calling the shots here? Is, is, do you think the president is actually aware of the fact that uh, 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 no one's getting to know him? Uh, unless you can well, go to the White House and talk to him? The, I mean, where did, um, there was a story in uh, Time. It, was, that in, I mean, that's, is, was that in Newsweek this, today that, that, that Laura Bush is upset about the campaign? It was in Time, but Evan it was, talking about the, the it was in Time because, well, but Evan Thomas works for yeah. Newsweek, right. But he was talking about the Time story. That's interesting. Right. Oh, right. But um, I didn't actually see it in the time. I read that story today, and it was mostly about Barbara Bush. Are we sure it was? I mean, I, I, again, I, fa I was looking for it because I saw it. It was mentioned. They were both upset. Well, I have some reporting to do because um, uh, I, I spoke to her, and I had this uh, – so what do I think? I think the president is calling an awful lot of shots with this campaign. Um, and uh, all the major decisions – are being made by by Bush, and you know when I say that people are stunned. I mean, you don't sound like you are, but people are stunned. You know, but he, you know, he learned at the knee of you know Lee Atwater. Let's not forget he that you know the take no prisoners political operative for his father. And um, but do I do I I hey, that's a really interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. Do I think that the president is concerned that people don't know who he is or whatever? No, I don't think he is now. It was, but that's the kind of thing a wife worries about, you know. Um, Laura Bush, when I talked to her, um, the most interesting thing she said was I asked her if she thought that Karl Rove's role was overstated, Karl Rove being the, you know, very powerful, you know, political advisor to the president. And she said, uh, yes, but Karl likes that. And it was a real dissing, yeah. you know. <laughs> it was, yeah. I mean, it was like, whoa. And I made sure when I – that interview, that was yeah. on the front page part of the New York Times. I mean, that was like – I mean, I almost wanted to lead with it, but I didn't. Um, so I don't know uh, – I don't know if Bush is concerned about it. Obviously, I guess he, his wife is. Um, I mean, Mike Deaver said to me that he thought that the White House, he was Reagan's guy, and he was the master that, the communicator that created the sort of Reagan staging that was so brilliant. And he said that he thought that their, their, their control has, has hurt, you know, has kept the, the, the real George Bush from coming out. Because you're absolutely right. Any, most reporters of the White House like the president, I mean, personally. There's no, it's impossible not to, you know. And when I say this to Democrats, they get, all upset and angry, and <laughs> I just said, you know, he's very Clinton-like in his charm, and in some ways, he's in, you know, one-on-one, -on -one he's in some ways better than Clinton because he's 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 in, in a funny way more more humble, you know, personally. And maybe he doesn't really think that, but but when you meet him, he's he's you know, he's a very gifted politician. There's no question about it. Um, and and in crowds, he's he's terrific too. You know, big rooms, big crowds. He's great. And um, 
they uh, uh, he's one of the best I've ever seen. You know, he's only gotten better too in the last couple of years. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. But what I've done for me is realize I have many more calls to make tomorrow. <laughs> you know, uh, this story. In, in part, do you think it's um, uh, it's a difference between campaigning and governing? that um, in governing what you're trying to do is put out your brand of leadership, which is going to be your policy initiatives right. and, and uh, what your goals are. Um, and that's what they focused on from the time that they've gotten there. And that in campaigning, the person of the president becomes important. Yeah, that's <coughs> and I think um, let's see what happens. Maybe this will be a shift or something. Uh, he um, He's very happy right now, people say, you know, in combat, and, you mm -hmm. know, in the political combat. And... He likes this a lot, and um, uh, I'm all for, you know, you know, I, I mean, it's just, it's so frustrating for me to write about mm -hmm. this White House. I mean, I didn't, I mean, George Bush is actually quite interesting. You know, I think the view of the country before, after he became president was he was just, again, this sort of shallow, not very interesting guy, but um, he's, he's more interesting to me now than he ever was, you know, three years ago because mm -hmm. of the way all the things that he's been through and just there's much more complexity in his personality than I mean as, as there is with anybody you know once mm -hmm. you you know get yeah. into it but in a way they have tried to um, you know increase well from not yeah. very many <laughs> 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 relatively increase the number of opportunities um, that he's had from time to time with reporters for example I'm thinking of the Air Force One um, the times well, on Air Force One yeah. when he's been coming back from uh, but it's from been trips. twice twice uh -huh. You know, I mean, the w one of them was, um, I think the first one I remember, oh, the first one Middle was East. after Aqaba, yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, this, he, there was this moment of euphoria that he had achieved this, uh -huh. you know, this sort of, this this breakthrough with the Palestinians and, and the Israelis. And um, and so he was just, I think he just, it, uh, you know, and I was not on that pool, in that Air Force One pool, but he mm -hmm. called reporters up to the conference room and, and you could see uh, his mind working. I mean, mm -hmm. that transcript was long. It was yeah. a lot of it was repetitive, yeah. but you could see you could see him engaged. It was really interesting. Uh -huh. And and the same thing happened um, uh, after the Baghdad secret Baghdad trip. Uh -huh. He was called up, and that was uh -huh. less about policy and more just a, an excited <laughs> person talking about this this uh -huh. you know this secret thing he pulled off. Yeah, and, th and then there was the um, uh, the tour that he took through the um, uh, through his property. You, you remember that where he was talking for yeah, you know, that for a couple of hours. That was a Christmas walk or something, wasn't it? Was that last? It, um, yeah, it, it was. It was some while. I was thinking of one that was in uh, the summer. In fact, it might have been that uh, that uh, yeah. first summer. But you got a real sense of yeah. what he enjoyed and what he enjoyed about um, about Texas. And, and I about mean, when you property. when you talk to him, he's yeah. like talking to it's like it's it's you, you're talking to a normal person. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other thing I the problem I have is he was my husband's classmate at Yale, so he's my husband's age. And I mean, just for me, it's more. I mean, he's so I never forget he's the president, but it's also he's uh -huh. he's a more familiar than he might be, you uh -huh. know. So um, not that that my, they were very good friends or anything. But um, anyway. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Any let's go to Towson. A quick question. I was wondering. I was wondering. Do you think it will be possible? It's possible that your job would have been more exciting, maybe 30 years ago, when presidents were more arguably accessible in a non-formal way, and also maybe you wouldn't have as much of a pressure, editorial pressure, what you can write and uh, what are the deadlines. Can, so le can you lean forward um, towards your microphone more because you're breaking up? Is this better? Yeah. A little bit. Get farther down <laughs> if you can. <laughs> okay, so my question is, I'm trying to speak slowly so you can ah, hear better. That's much, much better. My question is, do you think your job might have been more exciting about 40 years ago when the White House was arguably less closed than today's administration yeah. and where president was being met in a less formal environment and also where maybe the pressure from the editors and the deadlines you mentioned would have been smaller? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to know. Um, I'm sure the pressures were there very intense back then 40 years ago that was only uh the 
Well, that was only the 1960s. That was Kennedy. That um, there was. I'm actually. You know what? I can tell you, my uncle uh, Frank Cormier, may he rest in peace, was the um, was the uh, senior White House. He was the uh, AP yeah. senior White House oh, correspondent. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, and he was in Dallas when the president was shot. So, so 40 years ago, I, of course, there was. It was not that much different from now except that it wasn't a 24-hour news cycle but there were um, uh, I mean I think Kennedy was more accessible uh, he uh, created the first you know um, and they and he had you know terrific relations with the press he's famous for that um, and uh, he started the White House news conference I mean if you want to go back you know to the time of FDR Maybe that would that would have been a very exciting time during the Second World War to cover the White House, um, and you do see pictures of, of, of again reporters with mm -hmm. FDR, and um, uh, so I uh, I don't think it would have been easier, um, but I um, I, I mean I, I think it's it's you know, it's just impossible today to think that there would be the press. There's too many reporters. It's too it's too big. It's too much of a monster now for it to be uh, the way it was in the old days. Yeah, and there was so much pressure um, it, during uh, going back and reading uh, Roosevelt press conferences. In one of them, uh, Roosevelt uh, asked, um, I think it was Robert Nixon, it was either Robert Nixon or Doug Cornell, um, if they, if it was true that the day before, because uh, they were both wire service reporters, um, I can't remember which one it was, but um, whether he had, uh, it's true that he had written 15,000 words the day before. Because it was a very, it was a, it was a huge news story. I don't oh remember my God. what it was. And oh so, my God. And so <laughs> Helen um, was uh, talking about yeah. uh, Doug in a time when he uh, dictated for an hour and a half. And so there were, there were, there have always been lots of pressures. Um, even at the time of, uh, of William Price, I was looking for, I was going back in the Evening Star and uh, looking for a White House reception, the January 1st reception and what had happened in that reception. And so I looked at the, the uh, January 2nd, the 3rd, and I couldn't find it. And then I went back and looked at January 1st. And because it was um, a PM paper, that they had a report on what the reception was that morning at the White House. That was so, a fast turnaround. So that is really a fast turnaround, yeah. Well, my uncle, you know, when he was covering the White House, there was no, uh, there were, it was pre it was the 60s, but there were no computers. They were still typing on manual typewriters if you want to see something funny uh, you know I mean the the, the uh, that fabulous book the boys on the bus by Timothy Krauss it's still mm -hmm. it holds up I read it it's about the 72 campaign mm -hmm. yeah they're all lugging yeah. around portable typewriters <laughs> you know uh, manual typewriters my uncle used to um, dictate off the top of his head he never wrote anything down he just he you know that was what wire, really good wire service reporters could do in those days and uh, the reason I even know this, because I, I was in, you know, in, in elementary school in the 60s, was um, Jim Gerstenzang, who, from the L.A. Times, uh, who, uh, in the last, he's left the White House speech just recently, but he, the first couple years of this administration, he was covering the White House for the L.A. Times. He worked with my uncle, and he would tell me these wonderful stories about, you know, my Uncle Frank, you know, just sort of, flipping through his old you know reporter's notebook and and uh, just dictating into the phone cradling it in his on his shoulder dictating into the phone in perfect sentences with perfect punctuation and then when the story was done he would just throw the notebook over his shoulder into the wastebasket you know it's great image of you know because he said he never saved anything um, I you know dictating off the top of your head in perfect sentences is is really hard uh -huh. you know and he talked. About, um, uh, I interviewed. I interviewed him. Frank. And uh, yeah, Frank. And uh, one of the things I um, I remember is uh, his story of the, of the difficulties of dealing with Lyndon Johnson. Right. That, um, that Johnson was a president who could complain, and so uh, Johnson had complained about a story that um, that. Uh, you know, in wire service re reporting, they're, uh, you know, it's spare, it's, um, right. it's, uh, it's pretty clean, you don't have, um, often you don't have a lot of uh, reaction. But anyway, Johnson had been upset about one of his stories, and it, it must have been around Christmas time. Because he said at Christmas, Johnson used to give reporters presents. And so <laughs> that particular um, Christmas, it was a, uh, a tie, uh, tie clasp with a presidential seal on it. And he said he opened his box. 
and he said it was empty. <laughs> <laughs> and he said he knew that was that was Johnson. <laughs> wow. But on the other hand, he said that when his uh, parents had uh, come into town, that Johnson um, had heard that and that he gave them a tour. And he, so yeah, he said, you know, the president could be a couple of different things. So that, yeah. you know, you knew him, you saw him uh, a lot more, but it, they, it yeah. wasn't necessarily uh, <laughs> it wasn't necessarily good what uh, what you heard from him. You could feel his anger. It wasn't just the staff. It was the president who got after you. Yeah. <coughs> um, uh, hi, Ms. Bomiller. Uh, thank you uh, for coming here. I'd like to add that... Uh, <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, it's a, I can't claim any credit for that. But it's, a, it's a really good website, though. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. They do a really good job with it. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, my uh, question is actually, uh, um, do you uh, feel that there's a belief in justice in the community that I think that uh, I, mean, I, I came in late, but I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, that's, I haven't talked about that, yeah. Those are those are good questions. I can't really answer them. I can't. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, uh, there was a big the, the 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 briefing I said a little earlier was the the White House briefing was dominated today by questions about Spain, and the question was, how much of a problem is the loss of this ally for the Bush administration? And they won't answer it, you know, because there there's really we were wondering there's really no answer they can say publicly, which is uh, they can't you know, malign another democratically elected government, you know, and and so they can't say this is a problem for us. But obviously they're really concerned about it. I mean, their their view is that, their view publicly, their view is privately is that the terrorists won because what they wanted to do was use terrorism to uh, affect political change. And so they got, and it worked, okay. And, um, so I think the Bush administration is really concerned about this. Now, it's more symbolic than anything else. There's only 1,300 Spanish troops in Iraq, so pulling them out is not going to make a huge difference to what we do there. Um, as for the Olympics, uh, that's a really good question. I don't know. I think the, the other really big concern, obviously, is terrorism in Athens, and you know that's a very worrisome given uh, you know that. I mean, I guess they're doing everything they can, but it's... Yeah. Nerve-wracking to think about it. Yeah. 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 Um, Towson, do we have a question from Towson? I've got a quick question about. Uh, could you talk a little bit about Jason Blair and what <laughs> yeah. that has meant to you as yeah. not only a Times reporter but as a reporter in general? Yeah. Oh, right. Well, I, uh, I I hardly knew Jason. I knew him to say hello to. Um, well, obviously it turned the, I mean, I, there's nothing I can say that's that startling to you. It turned the paper upside down and was a terrible, terrible period in the paper's history. Um, and uh, it affected all of us uh, uh, um, in a big way. Um, I think um, I mean, it, our uh, our executive editor, you know, it, it just turned the whole it turned the paper upside down. We have we have all new. I have a lot of new editors now as a result. Um, I mean, they were there before. They just there was you know Howell left and Gerald Boyd left, and but it was a really diff it was hard. I'll tell you something. It was a hard time to work at the paper in that last spring when this was going on. There was about five or six weeks between the times. The time that that Jason the, the the first came out that he had plagiarized this story and then and then it was like this house of cards and it was just this so it was a very it was hard to work at the paper it was hard to concentrate I don't think the paper was at its best I certainly think the the Washington bureau was particularly hard hit because it had been um, there had been so much animosity between the Washington bureau and Hal Raines and um, so it was a relief when it all settled down. 
basically this summer and then finally this fall um, when all the new people were in place. Um, but I think, and I don't mean this, this is sort of like, you know, White House spin, but I do think it, um, there were a lot of good reforms that were started at the paper because of Jason Blair. They're not, they're never going to stop us from having another Jason Blair, but there, we, there's a much more uh, stringent sourcing policy now, which drives me crazy, but we do it. You know, they, um, you now have to tell one editor who the source is, who the Republican supporter of the president is, you know, and I mean, I never made it, I've never made anything up, you know, I'm, I, but, but now it's good that it's there, you know, that they, they asked us to do it. I mean, I had to write, I wrote a, filed a story last night, which was in the paper today, and there's a non, there's a Republican supporter of the president, and they're quoted. Well, last night at home, I got a call from the editor saying, Elizabeth, you've got to tell me who this is under our new policy. And I said, oh, okay. You know, so I told her, and, and um, you know, I, I don't know what that does, but I guess it keeps a lot of people more honest, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, I think it's good. I mean, what it has done is it's unleashed, uh, practically speaking, um, it, externally, it's unleashed a, a huge amount of animosity towards the time so that I think um, people get angrier. I mean, it, it just... People who don't read the Times often decide, you know, write in and complain about it, and they don't know what they're talking about. But I think it became the Times became a a uh, uh, what's the word, you know, a whipping boy. A uh, it just became this lightning rod for a lot of criticism of the press in general. The Times is a really good paper. It's made up of people who work really hard, who are honest, who who try and get things right. I mean. Uh, but it's hard to, a lot of people don't, there's people out there who don't think that. Um, another, is there another Towson? Yes. Is that Towson? <laughs> no, no. We're, we're going to do Roger. Okay. Uh, <laughs> do you find with the, the 24 hour news cycle that uh, some of your stories get away from you with news happening? so quickly and it's often often over before it's almost started oh uh, that's a good question um you know those of us uh uh most reporters of the paper still <coughs> are focused on the paper you know we've got a website but and that moves all the time but um there isn't a huge amount of pressure on us to write for the website they have it that has its own staff because whether or not this will change i don't know but right now in 2004 the focus is still on making that that paper that comes out every morning really terrific, and so um, my focus is still on a tw on on every 24 hours I have to produce something. And if you know if but if at eight o'clock you know I mean it should be done by seven thirty eight o'clock they put it up on the website that's fine. But I didn't have to do extra for that. You know what I mean? So, but I do think yeah things move. I guess they move faster. You know I don't. Um, you know, some reporters really like to write for their websites. I, I'm still focused on on uh, on just getting a really good story in the paper and not just getting something in fast. I mean, sh sometimes what they'll do is um, that the times we have to write by three o'clock, if we have to write a summary of what the, our story is going to say for the next day, and I find that horrible because um, a lot of times you don't know what, you know half the people you want have tried to call I haven't called back. And, but sometimes now what they'll do is they'll take that summary, which is just, it, it traditionally has been an internal, you know, three or four hundred words that, that, that the editors carry into the page one meeting to decide if it's good enough to go on page one. And that sometimes they'll slap that up on the website, but they only do it if, if you give them permission, you know. Um, and that's a little alarming when you're just cranking something out and all of a sudden, I mean, I, I sometimes it's happened where I haven't known it's gone on the website. I remember I got a call. I wrote something just, you know, you, you write these things like in five minutes, you know, they're just, they're not gr great, you know, they just, you're, you're just telling the editors, here's what I got. And one time a couple summers ago, they slapped one up on the website and I didn't know it, but I then knew it because a White House person called and started complaining about it. And I said, what are you talking about? And I, and it was up on the website and there was a mistake in it, you know, because I wasn't, and so, I mean, that kind of stuff happens, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not driven like, I notice a lot of my colleagues are much more um, 24 hours than I am. You know, it depends on their metabolism. Um, 
the TV people are, are much more driven by it than I am. Mm -hmm. Would you say in reporting a story um, from the White House during the Reagan period and then um, now, would you say that the elements of a story are, are uh, pretty similar? Yeah. I mean, stories are always stories. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a kind of basic thing you do as a reporter. You do it in, I mean, I've noticed you kind of do it in any country of the world. You do it in almost any situation. I mean, if, you know, and. What it, do you look for? It's, it, it, well, well, you look for conflict. You know, mm -hmm. that's, what we're, that's what we're about. We're not, you know, the, uh, uh, contrary to the, the White House, you know, we're not supporting John Kerry. We're supporting conflict. You know, that's what we, that's what we do. I mean, it's not a story that, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, it's what we do. Um, and so that's where our bias is. If you're looking for, you know, divides between the members of the administration or, or problems, we cover, what we cover is problems. Basically, mm -hmm. I mean, this, we, oh, you know, I mean, I obviously the Spanish election was a news event, but to the extent that it's a story here, it's a problem for the administration. Uh -huh. You know, just like last week we covered Raimondo, the job czar I talked about earlier, who didn't, who, who got, who got undercut by the Kerry campaign. Uh -huh. You know, so that's it, where our bias is. Is that, in a sense, um, that looking for conflict is looking for? Uh, for their uh, soft points of looking yeah. for yeah, uh, and that's why they political problems. Yeah, that's why they don't like the press because it's our job is to you know, we're not we're not you know we generally don't write stories saying that everything was great at the White House today and you know this worked and that worked. I mean that's a given. We look for, mm -hmm. but I mean, you know so um, yes, we're looking for their vulnerabilities and of course they hate that. Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't they? Um, George Reedy once said that uh, presidents don't have uh, press problems. They have political problems. They right. often think that they're press problems, and they, they treat it that way and will go after reporters. But in reality, what they are are political problems. Well, I would certainly agree with that. Uh, I don't think the White House is a press problem at all. I think, you know, I think we're too, I mean, I think we could be a lot tougher on them. Uh -huh. You know, um, uh, I mean, they're getting a rough ride now because of Kerry, but that's because, you know, but that's because there's a, now there's a natural mm -hmm. daily conflict. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's, you know, it's right there on your email every day. It, there's, there's, you know, dueling emails from the Bush campaign and the Kerry campaign all day long. Mm -hmm. You know, gives you a headache. And, and, and in a way, <laughs> you can see things come into the briefing room. Uh, from right. the uh, from the campaign, right, and it, it comes into the briefing room, and then it's in the briefing room. Then you know, then obviously it's going to be part of a, a story. One yeah. of the things that it seems to have happened over the years is that uh, that White House staff people, after they leave, they go out into that political world and they go out with the sophistication that they learned in the White House. So in a way, it, that um, a White House has to keep ratcheting it up in order to keep. Uh, you know, to keep uh, current with, with all of the people who are out there who know how to right. impact a White House story, how to get into a White House story. Right. Um, I think that's what you're seeing with the Kerry campaign. Well, they are also a lot of the are veterans of, of you know, of, of, of past Democratic campaigns. Somebody told I should have put this in the paper. Somebody told me something so funny the other day that, that a lot of the Kerry people are from the – some of them are from the Dukakis campaign, and, and mm -hmm. the, the, the rap on Dukakis is now – that he didn't answer all the negative attacks and that he should have and they the, and these guys have learned their lesson and you know they're like you know the people who you know walked home from the civil war without their shoes and never again you know and so they will never let a single charge go unanswered and they haven't uh -huh. you know <laughs> counts for the you know tenor of the campaign okay. so far well one one last question um uh, Towson do you have one last one Is that a person there I, moving towards the microphone? I, no. I, I wonder if you uh, think Kerry's gotten a free ride yet so oh. far. You hear, you hear people argue that, that Bush is having a rough road and Kerry hasn't gotten really scrutinized by the press. Well, I was wondering what you thought of that. Um, he's, uh, that's certainly what the White House thinks. Um, yeah, I think there's, I mean, I think he did in, to some degree because there was nine guys and now there, well, nine, you know, people. And I think now he's beginning to get, um, um, some scrutiny. I, I I saw. I thought we had a pretty interesting, tough story on him today. Jody Wilgren had a really good story about him saying that I, I don't know exactly what he said. There's some debate about what he actually said, but 
we reported that you know he had said that foreign countries or foreign leaders, mm -hmm. you know, unnamed were hoping he would win, and mm -hmm. so. Um, and then he kind of waffled on it, and and she wrote a really good tough story, and and because um, he hasn't he's refused to name who these people are, and she also noted that he hadn't been overseas since 2002, so they must have told him it all before he ran for president, so um, I guess they told him in phone calls, I don't know, but um, so. Uh, your email or something, yeah. We don't know who they are. And the White House, you know, just went came roaring back today and said, uh, "Well, he better name them, or you know, um, or he's just that. Or the only alternative is to th think that he's making it up to attack the president." It was pretty tough. Scott said that. So I think he's getting a lot more scrutiny now, and it's really early. I mean, from we've done some stories about his his Senate record, but there's going to be endless, I promise you, stories looking at him uh, in a really tough way. <coughs> But um, he's only been in this. He's only been the, nom the presumptive nominee for what is his third week. We're only in the mm -hmm. third week of this thing. Yeah. And it's Monday, you know, the third week. That's right. And we have uh, 240 yeah. some days yeah. to go. Yeah. <laughs> this can be long. Yeah. A long, uh, long, tough campaign, as you pointed out on Sunday with the negative campaigning. Well, thank you very much, Elizabeth. I well, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.